So my 23-year-old son, the alleged atheist, who has a super Catholic sensibility, looked at the list of speakers for this conference I showed him, and he said, Ma, that is a wrecking crew. <laughs> so on our little wrecking crew today, it includes Ken Woodward, who is, of course, the longtime religion editor from Newsweek, winner of the National Magazine Award, and crucially, my fellow Notre Dame grad. Yeah. Then we have Vincent Cunningham, who's a staff writer at The New Yorker, where he's also a theater critic. And he teaches writing at Sarah Lawrence and worked in the Obama White House. And we have Father Matt Malone on the end here, the editor-in-chief of America Magazine, uh, who, when he was appointed in 2012, was the youngest EIC ever of the magazine. So thanks so much for being here, all of you. And I, I think we'll start off with Ken. Okay. You've all been here a while. Um, until today, this conference has dealt largely with the Catholic imagination as it relates to the arts, um, especially literature, also visual, uh, which is only right. The notion of a specifically Catholic imagination did not originate with theologian David Tracy's analogical imagination much less with sociologist uh, Gary, uh, Andrew Greeley's later book, Built on Tracy, The Catholic Imagination. Okay. It really began in the late 1940s and the early 50s with essays uh, like Ellen Tate's uh, The Symbolic Imagination, Flannery O'Connor's lecture on mystery and manners at Notre Dame in 1957, which I was uh, very fortunate to, uh, to attend. And um, books like William Lynch's uh, Christ and Apollo, published in 1960. And I think hovering over all of this was the influence and the power of Jacques Maritain from um, art and scholasticism, which was so important to Flannery O'Connor, as she wrote, um, through creative intuition in art and poetry, um, which I think came out in 1955 and was so influential, I know for a fact, Robert Fitzgerald, among other uh, uh, poets and writers. Uh, nonetheless, there can be no denying the culture-forming power of religion, whether it be on the sensibilities of an individual artist or on the ethos of whole communities, uh, like those uh, many towns in the South where it often seems there's more Baptists than there are people. Either way, we're talking about religion's capacity to shape, partly in a pre-conscious way, how we structure our experience of the world and our hopes and aspirations within and beyond it. That's what I take uh, the religious imagination to mean. My point this afternoon is this, whether you're an artist or a scholar or a journalist, merely curious or earnestly interfaithful, you cannot understand another religion, even, even another Christian tradition, unless you go beyond doctrine and practices and fully engaged with that tradition's religious imagination. History, I submit, bears this out. In his classic study, The Waning of the Middle Ages, Johann Heusinger, this is a book that was very important to me as an undergraduate and a graduate student, uh, argues that one of the reasons for the Protestant Reformation was the late medieval imagination, which brought the realm of Christ and the saints uh, into smothering proximity with ordinary daily life. And the medieval's concomitant habit of crystallizing religious thoughts into images. From this perspective, the Reformation was a reaction that put uh, God and the things of God at greater distance from this fallen world, thus allowing more space for human freedom and, of course, human folly. And a rejection of images and all other visual manifestations of heavenly presences in favor of the preached word. As you can see, Heusinger's historical observations align well with David Tracy's 
distinctions between the analogical imagination typical of Catholics, but not only Catholics, and the dialogical imagination, which he finds typical of the Protestant imagination. Uh, another touchstone text for me, as I try to understand and communicate different uh, religious imaginings to the readers of Newsweek, and keep in mind, uh, whenever I wrote something in Newsweek, uh, even if it was about the Catholics, of which there were many, I was always, it was always news to most of our readers. Could be the Adventists, could be the Mormons, whatever. Uh, anyhow, um, the other book is uh, I want to mention is Eric Heller's Disinherited Mind. In one essay, Heller points to the famous dispute between Luther and Zwingli over the Eucharist. Was the presence of Christ in the consecrated bread and wine real, as Luther contended, or symbolic, which was Zwingli's position? In Heller's view, Zwingli's stand signaled a hugely consequential transformation in the Western sensibility, one in which the real was no longer symbolic and the symbolic became merely re, uh, symbolic. For Heller, this amounted to, quote, a radical change in that compact, um, complex fa fabric of unconsciously held convictions about what is real and what is not. Coming to the present, let's consider Pentecostalism, the world's fastest growing form of Christianity. Born in the USA and barely a century old, Pentecostalism strongly resembles, at least in this respect, late medieval Catholicism, as Heusinger described it, in that both exhibit a religious imagination in which God and the devil uh, intervened for good or ill directly in human affairs. There is no space in the Pentecostal imagination for the concept of natural law or even the laws of physical nature because these are, uh, the latter are malleable to prayer. As anyone knows who's ever watched Oral Roberts on television or Pat Robertson for that matter. Robert Orsi, who teaches religious studies up the street at Northwestern, has defined religion as, quote, the practice of making the invisible visible and argue that the proper focus of religious studies, therefore, should be on what he calls the sacred presences that form uh, the bonds, quote, between heaven and earth. He's thinking a lot of his Italian mother when, when he's talking about this, uh, who was greatly devoted to the saints. His approach certainly accords well with the Catholic and Hindu religious imaginations, but also with Mormonism, though it's not uh, so obvious uh, in not so obvious a way. Uh, for me, the Mormon imagination is best encountered in the vision of the afterlife elaborated by the prophet Joseph Smith. I didn't notice this until a Mormon friend told me uh, this story. It's a story of a former prophet of the church who had a major problem uh, uh, to solve and prayed repeatedly to his deceased predecessor for advice, but without response. Finally, an answer came back with this apology. I'm sorry, I didn't answer sooner, but I've been so busy up here. Anyone who has close friends among the Latter-day Saints quickly realizes that the church keeps its members very, very busy all week long because it's an ethos that's built on work. Not for nothing is Utah called the beehive state. Joseph Smith's genius, though, was to answer the problem of death in the 19th century by imagining the next life as a continuation, under better circumstances, of this one. A place where Mormon missionaries, like the former prophet, uh, would be, still be needed, where families would continue to expand and to cohere, and where those admitted to the highest of the heavenly kingdoms would work in order to progress uh, to the status of divinity like their heavenly father and mother. Excuse me. Thus, the Mormon imagination is neither analogical nor dialogical, but literal, as evidenced by the Mormon murals in the church's Salt Lake Center, City Center, or by the dioramas on display uh, in its uh, New York City Church Center, both of which make Soviet realism of the 1930s looked like cubism. 
But what can we say about the Protestant imagination? Uh, and some things have been said at this conference by Paul Schrader, which I found very interesting. Um, it would help if Protestants themselves would tell us. But a recent Google search turned up uh, no conferences like this one exploring the Protestant imagination, and only one book with that title, uh, with that phrase in the title, and it was the Protestant imagination from Calvin to Jonathan Edwards. Uh, it would seem particularly difficult to discern the religious imagination of Reformed Christianity since the iconoclastic John Calvin and his fellow reformers stripped the altars of statues, figured stained glass windows, of symbolic vestments, of any other visuals suggestive of sacred presences mediating between heaven and earth. Thus, one cannot imagine New York's uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art staging a show called Heavenly Bodies from John Calvin to Billy Graham. <laughs> Yet I would argue that there is a palpable religious imagination to be discerned even in preachers dressed in basic Baptist threads. Let me tell you a story. In 1972, Newsweek decided to put Billy Graham on the magazine's cover. Uh, for the first time. And so I, as the writer, flew out to Los Angeles to interview Billy. We met in a television studio, studio where Graham was reviewing a videotape of a recent crusade he held in Tennessee uh, with President Nixon there as his guest. Truth is, he was boosting Nixon's presidential uh, uh, campaign, re-election campaign. Uh, I watched Billy watching himself preach, and then I asked him what he was experiencing, thinking perhaps he was second-guessing his doppelganger on the, on the monitor. But that was not the answer I got. I quote, I get so engrossed, Ken, I don't think of, my, of the man on television as me, he said. I think of him as another person speaking because the Spirit of God begins to speak to me through him. Spirit of God is speaking to Billy through Billy on television. That was another aha moment for me. For Graham, for those who heard him, his performance resonated as a verbal sacrament, though of course he wouldn't use that term. One in which the word made flesh becomes through the medium of his own voice the flesh made word. In sum, it seems to me that we cannot fully appreciate the Catholic imagination unless we understand uh, the Protestant imagination in its various forms. The problem, I believe, is that we have been looking in the wrong, all the wrong places. We do not need eyes to see, we do need ears to hear. Protestant Christianity, particularly in its Calvinist forms, is essentially an oral, oral experience. That experience takes its most expressive form, not just in preaching, but above all in its music. Indeed, I suggest that a robust taxonomy of the, of the American Protestant imagination would be gleaned from a deep immersion in the music it has produced, from the psalmody of the Puritans, through the great Methodist hymns, especially of Charles Wesley, to the old rugged cross and that iconic celebration of revivalist experience of salvation, amazing grace. And let me leave you with this thought. Um, the next time your parish liturgist wants to play amazing grace during mass or afterwards, don't let him. Listen to the words. It's not part of a communal liturgy. It's when I got my, myself saved. Uh, it's a wonderful hymn, hum it in the shower, you know, sing it at a revival meeting, but it doesn't belong in the Catholic Mass. And if you don't recognize that, then anything I've said about the Protestant imagination hasn't meant anything to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I think this is fine. I, maybe, excuse my laptop, but maybe it's a little easier to deal with it up here, or maybe not. I'll do it here. I think I'm fine. Okay. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. Um, 
Thank you so much all for being here. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about my experience of writing um, material with more or less religious content within the context of a totally secular magazine like the New Yorker, which is sometimes um, a very confusing experience. I've often had the experience of writing a piece. I wrote a piece about hell uh, recently, and the response was often from people that are sort of stereotypically New Yorker readers who were like, thank you for writing about this fairy tale, like very condescendingly. <laughs> and, um, and people who write for um, publications like that are sort of more, much more seriously religious than the New Yorker, uh, assuming that I was some sort of condescending New Yorker writer who had written it in that, um, in the attitude of those other folks. So I often this sort of in the middle experience. The, um, but um, earlier this spring, um, earlier this year that is, in spring, I was walking with some friends um, into a church near a big plaza in Mexico City. And inside, there were other tourists milling around, and there were several groups of old ladies kneeling and praying. And um, what I always remember about this church, though, is that around the perimeter uh, was this incredible armada of statues and icons and great big candles huddled together. Um, and uh, on the walls, there were these great big paintings and in glass cases. There's these little lifelike dolls meant to represent the dead bodies of obscure saints of whom I'd never heard. Um, in one case, this huge cubicle case, there was a statue of a swarthy brunette Christ, and he's dragging his cross behind him, and the crown of thorns is sort of pulling out blood from his forehead. Um, and his eyes were bugged wide, and his mouth was drawn to this grimace. And my friends, none of whom have spent much time at all in um, Catholic churches, were really recoiling from this. Um, one of my friends was like, this is grotesque. Um, and spooked into reverence though I was, I started kind of weirdly, but maybe predictably because of what I do, I started thinking about magazines. <laughs> um, and I guess I should explain that. Um, whenever somebody asks me uh, what kind of writer I am, I get a little flustered. Um, I write theater crit criticism. Um, I write celebrity profiles. I write web posts about basketball games. I uh, write little considerations of photographs and other images that I find on the internet. Um, I write long reported pieces. I'm working on a novel. I'm like always confused, right? Um, but, um, but what I almost invariable, invariably say when I'm asked that question is that I'm a magazine writer because I think a magazine writer, magazine writing, that is, is uh, another way to say that you're often confused. Um, <laughs> um, in a magazine like The New Yorker, there's reporting and there's political commentary. There's all kinds of criticism. There are, um, there are comics, right? There's all kinds of things. Um, and uh, in other words, though, there are any number of portals into which, um, into the world of the magazine, any, any number of windows into which a sort of reader can, uh, can kind of climb. Um, and one of my favorite things uh, when I talk to somebody who's a reader of the magazine and has been for a long time um, is to hear not whether they read it, but how they read it. Um, some people go straight to the cartoons. Some people go straight to the goings on about town blurbs, which I really enjoy writing these like 140 word um, blurb. Some people go straight to the reviews. Um, the important thing is that a magazine, which is a purve purveyor in some senses of a, a total sensibility, um, it doesn't present itself as a monolith, uh, but instead as an array of aspects and vantages. A row of windows for any reader to um, open and enter and the way that I think about my work as a magazine writer is to achieve the kind of versatility or productive, fruitful confusion that can help to fill a form like this, um, to make your own private concerns and preoccupations open up just as the magazine opens up. Um, and I find Catholicism to be something like that too. Um, Ken mentioned Pentecostalism, a very brief religious history. I was, baptized Catholic and then raised mostly Pentecostal from the, the ages of 10 until 
until whenever I got to choose for myself again. Um, but there, I, one of the great differences between those traditions that I've often found is two different, um, two different expressions of freedom. Uh, in Pentecostalism and other charismatic religions, often the freedom that you see that's happening, somebody might be running around here and somebody's dancing over here and somebody's singing or making some other sort of verbal ejaculation, right? So every, things are happening all around you, but it all comes from a space of sort of, um, to me it has seemed inner freedom. Everybody is accessing um, their channel of grace and making this kind of uh, communication on their own. Whereas I've always found freedom in Catholic churches. What I love about Catholic churches as edifices is their sort of spatial freedom that happens. You walk in maybe a half hour before mass and there's someone kneeling in front of the candles and there's somebody looking at the painting and there's somebody in front of a statue of a favorite saint and there's somebody fingering their rosary and there's somebody kneeling, right? That, that there's a spatial thing that happens before the more communal thing that everybody's coming sort of slowly to encounter. And um, so all those statues and dolls, all those paintings and pews and banks of candles um, in Mexico presented themselves not to me, not as impositions, but as options. There are so many ways in, the nuances of song, uh, the lives of the saints, the words of the catechism, the rhythms of the liturgy and mass. And you can sit in your seat, you can drop to your knees, um, or you can walk around it as I did regarding these statues with an odd mixture of horror and love. Um, so when I think of how it is to sometimes write about religious ideas at a magazine like the New Yorker, I, I imagine a mansion within another mansion, a prism, uh, one prism inside the other. Um, like I mentioned, over the past few years, I've written about hell. I uh, reviewed a book about Pro Pope Francis, a play by Tom Stoppard that had sort of everything to do with belief. Um, I reviewed a concert documentary uh, by Aretha Franklin, her, uh, uh, her Amazing Grace, uh, her... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, <laughs> her tremendously uncatholic, uh, <laughs> um, amazing grace. But each each one of those has had something more or less explicit to do with God. But all often, you know, I was telling a story just the other day that one of my colleagues, I was having dinner, and I was saying, "Yeah, you know, I'm working on this and working on that," and I had said nothing about religion or anything like that. And he's like, "You know, everything has to do with God for you." I was like, "What do you, what do you mean?" You, I, I thought I was disguising myself just a tiny bit better than this, right? Um, but um, even in those moments when that presence is less obvious, I find that to be enabled somehow by the, in the same way that um, I find uh, the relationship between reality and my faith to be it's essentially a matter of interpretation, a matter, um, a sort of exegetical matter. In the same way, um, it's possible over time as uh, people read a magazine and find their way into it to to exercise that sort of interpretation in your work in that magazine. So um, that's what I hope that I'm doing in my work, and um, I hope we can talk more about stuff like that. So thanks so much. <laughs> a bit more people than table, so it's a, a difficult maneuvering back here. Uh, my brothers and sisters, it's really a great pleasure to be with you today, and thank you for this uh, invitation. And I think uh, as far as these opening statements are concerned, you're probably going to hear very three different and distinct theses, but uh, all of them important, and I think during the course of the discussion, we'll see how they're related. Uh, I am a Jesuit. I should begin with a confessional, right? <laughs> appropriately enough. We have our um, <laughs> and the, uh, when I think about, uh, when I think about that, when I think about my work at American Magazine, I think, first of all, of course, of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus. If you have ever been to Rome, then, and, and you have ever visited the Church of the Jesu, the headquarters church of the Jesuits there, then you'll notice something interesting about it, at least I did. I first saw it. And that is, whereas the, the, the front of many or 
probably most churches in Rome, uh, is parallel to the street. The Jesu, the facade of the Jesu is perpendicular to the street. Um, there is a, there's a way in which if you want to get beyond it, you have to go through it. You have to go around it. You have to confront it, in other words. That positioning is itself a product of the imagination of Ignatius of Loyola. His great innovation was not to found a religious order, because we had those, um, and they were doing just fine. Ignatius's innovation, uh, the imaginative leap that he took, was to move the religious order from the outskirts of town to downtown, right at the intersection of the church and the world. Right? He envisioned an order of men at the center of the action, as it were. And that act of imagination is what inspires, in some way, every work of the Society of Jesus. And it certainly inspires uh, the work of America Magazine, which is now in its 111th year of publication. America is also situated downtown, or as we call it in New York, midtown, <laughs> right? Um, but the, the, the location that we occupy is, uh, is not a literal one. It's not a literal piece of geography. Um, it is uh, itself an act of the imagination. Um, for the, the founders of America knew, the, well, both the country and the magazine, but in this instance, the magazine, they knew that the most important municipality was an intellectual one. It was that um, space in which ideas are exchanged and debated, um, what a later generation would come to call the public square. And so America, the magazine, was founded um, and set up shop overlooking the public square, right at the intersection of the church and the world. And we have been opining about what we see from our vantage point for, as I said, 111 years, for better or for worse. What do we see from that vantage point today? Well, I think we see many of the same things that you see. Um, and since our charge is to, um, is to co offer commentary and analysis from a Jesuit Catholic perspective on public affairs, um, what we see first is the, is the character and the conduct of the public affairs of this country, which is not so great right now. We see, uh, I think, probably what you see, which is a public discourse that has really broken down and is structured and driven by ideological partisanship. Right? Now, I don't mean differences of opinion. A democracy presupposes differences of opinion. Um, and actually, I think any human enterprise involves differences of opinion. What I mean is uh, a partisanship that is driven by ideology, closed systems of thought, questions that answer themselves. In that sense, because of that, the closed nature of our partisanship, um, we are not arguing with each other. John Courtney Murray, the mid-20th century Jesuit theologian who was a contributor to America Magazine, he said that argument is actually a difficult thing to have because you have to share certain things in common, a shared set of premises, a common uh, source for data, the facts of the matter. Uh, but most importantly, Murray would say, you have to have the freedom to be wrong. You have to enter into the public debate as, uh, as a mode of encounter rather than mere confrontation. Right? So there is no arguing happening in the public square. And that is a vital threat to the health of the body politic. But if that's not disturbing enough, we actually see something even more disturbing than that from our vantage point. And that is too often in the uh, church, we are thoughtlessly importing the categories 
of our secular politics and using those to structure our interactions with one another. That in a sense, we are thoughtlessly mimicking in our ecclesial dialogue what we are seeing in the secular dialogue. Now, if, if, if doing that is a threat to the, to the body politic, it is an even greater threat to the body of, of Christ. Because the body of Christ is a different reality than the body politic. This is what I mean. The, the church is not a polis, right? and it's not one more agent organized for public action. Right? The church um, is in no way a private actor. I mean, we make truth claims that are ipso facto, um, that, are, uh, that are objective claims to reality, right? and they are therefore public claims. The church is not a polis, it's a sacrament. Right? Our unity does not reside in our allegiance to a shared set of propositions, but in our devotion to a person and to the actions that that person has taken in human history. Right? The ultimate source of our unity as Catholics stems, uh, resides in the person of Jesus Christ who is the way and the truth and the life. And why is that important? Well, I, you know, there are two competing notions of truth in the world, broadly, broadly speaking. One is that truth is just, it's an objective reality, uh, and, you know, discovering and articulating what truth is is a matter of making propositions that correspond as closely as possible to those to describing those objective realities. The other is that it's entirely a subjective or personal reality, that the individual is the maker of truth, um, that uh, rather than merely the discoverer of truth. But the teaching of the Second Vatican Council is clear and also ingenious, because the, the teaching of the Vatican Council says a pox on both your houses. Truth is personal, but that person isn't you. That person is Jesus Christ, the way and the truth and the life. Our, in reality, our unity resides in his person. That's precisely why we are the body of Christ. Why is that important? Because that should give us the freedom to be wrong. And we can then discover anew that our, that our engagement with one another can be structured around encounter rather than mere confrontation. And if we can do that, then we can hold up to the larger world a model for engagement that is different than the one that we see in the secular sphere. In other words, truth is a someone it's not a something. If it is a something, then it's a something that we will use to beat each other over the head. We can therefore never claim to possess the truth. Our, our lives as Catholics, as disciples, um, our public witness as disciples, has to come from the reality that we merely hope that he possesses us, the one who is true. Right? That alone gives us the freedom to engage, to break through the uh, a closed system of thoughts that closes off from one another, both within the church and without. That alone gives us the opportunity to really engage with the freedom um, to change, but also to be changed by, that, by those with whom we engage. In a sense, our task is to remember that the object of Christian discipleship is not to be right, it's to be holy. Thank you. Hard to bridge those three. <laughs> Thank you.
those were great. So, Matt, to your point about Catholic media and Catholics in media sometimes, unfortunately, mimicking the culture instead of challenging it. Um, well, first, amen. I mean, when I look at Catholic Twitter sometimes, it's just um, not easy to tell the difference, right? It's instead of... Uh, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. It's more like rock throwing all day long. Um, so how do we get from that confrontation to encounter? Well, in a, can you, can you hear me? In, in, a, in a sense, it's, it's, uh, it's the work of conversion, right? Um, I agree with you. I, I think that, that too often we see in the Catholic media and the Catholic press, um, we see patterns of engagement that are not different enough from what we see in the secular culture that don't really reflect the reality of who we are. I mean, if, if people see first things as Fox News, though it's not, and they see National Catholic Reporter as MSNBC, and they see America as CNN, then we have failed. We have failed, right? But that is a failure of our imagination. Mm -hmm. right? um, in, and so in a sense, um, and, and, and the principal culprit here in our failure to imagine a different ecclesial reality um, is in large measure clericalism. But it's not necessarily the clericalism that we hear so much about. Um, it's the clericalism that affects all of us. It's this notion that, um, the, that, the, that the church is someone else, right? That's fundamentally what clericalism is, right? That the church is someone else and responsibility for its stewardship and responsibility for bearing public witness to what it proposes to the, to the world is someone else's responsibility, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that can affect clerics as well as lay people. It affects all of us, right? So in, in a sense, I think overcoming that, that, uh, um, overcoming that sort of built-in cultural habit um, will allow us to then be a different kind of church and bear a different kind of witness mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, in the public square. But in the end, uh, it is something that we are led to. Um, it is, uh, it's the process of conversion, right? It's uh, allowing ourselves to, um, to be possessed by the Lord um, so that our disagreements with one another are not a dagger in our hearts, but a thorn in our side. Either one Can I speak to that for just a minute? Uh, that's all very nice, but uh, I remember the Catholic Common Ground uh, Movement. I'm sorry. I remember the Catholic uh, Common Ground Movement, Matt, you recall that? And uh, Joe Bernardine started that here in this town. Um, and I remember going to a, a meeting of that, and none of the conservative folks showed up. So somebody who, who was first was head of the Catholic uh, Health Association took the part and made the conservative argument, which is a wonderful gesture. Um, but there was this sense of contamination. You are contaminating my church, uh, my belief system. Um, so it's, it's even rougher than the way you've described it, it seems to me. But the, there was no effort to come together. I could get together with J Richard John Newhouse, cause, and he said, you know, the important thing is we agree on the essentials. And he was not an easy guy often to get, to get along with, but it could be done. I myself was born before these divisions occurred, and, um, and I'm just not comfortable for them for that reason alone. Um, so, uh, but I, the point I really wanted to make in regard to this is my impression is that the political world and its emotions and divisions have taken uh, uh, over uh, the religious. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't give a damn that, uh, whether you're Catholic or, or, or not. I want to know if you're on my side politically. 
And I find, uh, whether it's on Catholic University campuses or any place else, that it's these real or presumed positions, secretly you did vote for Trump, didn't you? You know, that kind of thing, that has, has swallowed what might be legitimate differences in understanding a, a common faith. But that still leaves us with the question of how to get from where we are now to being advertisements walking through the world for the way, the truth, and the life, right? May I just briefly mm -hmm. respond? Um, I, I would just say, Ken, that I think it's it's not nice. It's the opposite of nice. It's the um, it's the radical reality of who we are as a church, and uh, we, when we fail to live out of that then what happens is precisely what you just described. Our whole discourse is structured in exactly the way that it is in politics. The word conservative, the word liberal, these are not in the gospel. They right. belong to um, political science, right? And so I, the, 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 the very power that has um, within it, uh, the ability to, to shift our perspective and to open us up to one another and to a new reality is that very thing that we always skip over or that we give lip service to. The deepest source of who we are is not um, a sentiment, right? It's a, it's a reality, it's a living person, or it is nothing. The church either is the body of Christ um, and it is the Lord's instrument on earth, or it is nothing. There's no other choice here. Um, and so I'm just inviting us to live out of that reality as a means of overcoming the very divisions you're describing. I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm absolutely in agreement with you. I, I just made me think of the Stanley Harawas used to say, we Methodists, he taught at Notre Dame, you know, the Catholic scene well, we Methodists are so nice. We're so nice. <laughs> and then he would say, yes, but the word nice is not a thing gospel, which is true. Um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. What, uh, what impact do you think that Catholic media and Catholic writers and secular media are having on some of our important debates? Like, for example, uh, one that I write about most often is probably immigration and asylum, which I find what's happening in our country is just so frightening uh, on that front. Um, do you think that, and that's a place where the institutional church really cannot be faulted, but does, does that come through? Is there an impact on the debate, or you know, how do you see that? Uh, I think it's, um, for some of the reasons that we've already talked about, I think it's hard to tell whether there's a sort of monolithic or like totemic role for Catholic media to play in those debates, precisely because um, and, and this comes from a totally sort of uh, at least professional bystander's position. But as I um, watch the sort of the discourse that happens among publications, avatars of publications, it does seem that there is a sort of um, reproduction of the same the same ar over over this issue. Right? There is a sort of it seems to me that there has emerged a kind of Catholic nationalism that is uh, sort of commensurate or uh, parallel to someone like, not even parallel to him, is in some ways inspired by the person of someone like Steve Bannon, right? We've seen him try to uh, directly um, inject himself into Catholic politics and therefore, in some ways, Catholic uh, editorial life. I think that's, we, we've seen that happen. So um, it's hard, I mean, it seems to me that the one place where this would happen is the sort of editorial page. I always read the the Abeds in America, and I always admire them for their um, charity and sanity and clarity. Um, but it often there is a moment. It it often seems to me where those um, perhaps more dispassionate statements that draw on the Gospels and draw on um, you know. The wonderful words of Pope Francis. He should. He should, in, in certainly with respect to immigration, he should be a, a beacon because it seems to me mm -hmm. that he talks about these things. Um, it's the and very it, first thing he did as pope. Absolutely. Was and um, and sometimes 
that that for lack of a better word a better phrase sometimes that attitude trickles down but other times um he then becomes the locus of further right. confrontation um so it's you know it's i think it's e equally chaotic you know in some ways yeah I, I i i agree with that and i think you're right i think that the u.s conference of catholic bishops has um has been a really powerful and strong voice on this issue um, in, the, in the, uh, the public debate. Uh, but I think that there is a way in which we, we can talk about our witness as Catholics uh, only in, in this very narrow sense. You know, we, we talk about uh, what uh, is in the, uh, the pages of our periodicals and what the bishops are saying, what they're doing or not doing. You know, but if our whole frame of reference is what the bishops are doing or not doing, they're either doing a great job or they're doing a bad job, um, then that's a form of clericalism, right? The reality of the church is, and its response to this issue, um, is those things that we often mention, but it's, it's considerably more than that. There's a ministry of the church on every border on every, in every county on the southern border. There is a ministry of the church in every county on the southern border. That is first and foremost the response of the church. Mm -hmm. right? um, and that is uh, itself the, uh, I think, the a Catholic imagination at work, uh, more so than these more tactical, political interventions. Mm -hmm. um, What's that? What's that saying? Is you know we're we're, we're we are we are going to transcend um, we're going to transcend the, the the crappy time and space that is our politics and go to work, right? And do something different, something that is transformative, right? Because in the end, it, it's it's uh, not just a Catholic imagination at work, or I should say, when we're talking about a Catholic imagination at work, we're really talking about a sacramental imagination at work. Right. Right. We're going to make something real here now that transcends the time, the crappy time and space that is our cable news lineup. Mm -hmm. Angela O'Donnell said yesterday that she really sees the Catholic imagination being boosted by Catholic media in part by reviews of Catholic works in Catholic media. Um, cultural coverage in, secular, in much of the secular media and for example, in, in my newspaper has basically gone away as, you know, all of our critics have been laid off. Um, we, there's a, a lot of that kind of coverage. We don't review books anymore, period. Forget Catholic books. Um, so what, what is the state of the, as we're struggling for survival, I should say, to state the obvious, so uh, what is the state of Catholic media, and is it different from secular media? Well, I, I, I want to step back from them, and I, I've heard, heard all good news about the new uh, re review media uh, at this conference, um, but it's all self-generated generated from within the fold, so to speak. Uh, as someone who worked in a secular magazine, and I wanted to say to Vincent here, there aren't many Catholics at the New Yorker. And David Remnick, having gone crazy over Lane Pagel, shows that he doesn't know anything about this sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, a little dig of mine. So I think you will find, as I found at Newsweek, if you're the only Catholic there, you, lucky is your uh, opportunity because you get to define what Catholicism is because there's no competition <laughs> for it. Whereas in America Magazine, there might be. Um, no, but uh, so they do pay, they pay attention to you. I'm really more worried less about the political uh, that we've been talking about than I am about um, the, not only the cultivation of a Catholic sensibility and a Catholic imagination, but even introducing and passing this along along with other elements of the faith, it seems to me it's uh, uh, Catholic through their institutions of higher learning especially, simply are not doing that. Melinda and our alma mater would never have a course on modern Catholic writers. It doesn't happen. You'll get the same sort of thing you'll get from any, any other um, uh, English department there. 
Uh, they're not going to read uh, uh, Dostoevsky uh, with those kinds of eyes, much less read uh, Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory. Um, how many of them ever heard of Flannery O'Connor? Oh, Jim, I hope it's not that bad. <laughs> well, I, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid it is. Maybe Hopkins. Maybe Hopkins, if they're lucky. Um, so if you are not sort of, pass, if you will, passing on the Catholic imagination, um, that, that's not a healthy situation, and that's what I think the, the situation is. Um, and I think Dana Green, uh, Dana uh, Joya, has, uh, was in a good position to see that. Um, how there wasn't much in the way of the Catholic imagination uh, at Catholic colleges and universities. Several people have said that it's Catholic art, Catholic writing, that will bring young people in particular back to the faith. Do you, if you don't see it happening, happening in academia, and I'm not sure I totally agree, mm -hmm. um, do you see it happening elsewhere? I think that I think that though there is certainly a um, you mentioned Catholic Twitter, which is you know um, scary. Yeah, and similarly <laughs> dispiriting to me. It does, though. I think reflect a larger. Um, it seems to me that because of in the number of factors, more people are up for grabs in many different ways, just, just ideologically. Like there, I mean, I, there are people picking up books of political theory and theology and all different kinds of things because I don't think that the world um, over the past 20 years or whatever has uh, lent itself to easy comprehensibility. So I think that um, there's this term online where you can be red-pilled. It, <laughs> uh, it, it means that you can be tugged into some terrible ideology by sort of swirling deeper and deeper down the toilet that is the internet. Like you'd sort of wake up in the morning, a nice regular sort of um, <laughs> suburban kid, and by the end of the day, you're like, you know, um, you believe in seven different conspiracy theories. And, you know, um, that, that's, that's a, a very scary proposition, but I think that um, in some ways it's an obvious opportunity as well, right? And not just for... Um, any religion uh, per se, but certainly f for different works of art, works of literature. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are, um, people are picking up all kinds of books that they hadn't before because mm -hmm. um, in some ways trying to find a way, a new way to, to see the world. I, I think that's something to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question and um, our, attempt, our, our attempts to answer the, our, uh, reveal something. It seems to me that, as I said, a, a Catholic imagination is a sacramental imagination, right? It's a different conception of time and space. Um, there is, I mean, if we want to know what a Protestant imagination is, it's what we're sitting in, right? That's what this country is. It's the product of a Protestant imagination um, for, and with, with all that, that is good and all that is not good about it, right? Um, the culture of this country is Protestant. So in a sense, it should be easier for us to say, uh, oh yeah, th these folks are really you know, breaking through and, and bearing witness to a, a Catholic understanding of reality. Um, it should be easier us, for us to point to those people than it, it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, to me, it's, it's the difference uh, between the two is precisely that different conception of time and space. So if you, you know, Bill Kavanaugh, who's I think a really great theologian, uh, talked so much, he's, he's talked a lot about this, but it's, there, it's different readings of, the, of Augustine. You know, you have, are the city of God and the city of man spaces, or are uh, they phenomena, or, um, you know, uh, communities that transcend time and space, in a sense, right? In other words, can you point to it in the here and now, right, or, um, is, it, is, it, is it all mixed up? Maybe that's why we're going to have a second coming, right? I think Catholics resist that notion that you can point to one or the other, right? There's a reason why the Scarlet Letter is 
is set in Massachusetts and not in Milan, right? <laughs> right, so this already elicits, elicits a chuckle, right? Because the notion of it happening in Milan is absurd on one level, right? Um, it's only in the Catholic Church in the United States do we have debates about whether you can share a stage with a public official who has a different view of this public policy issue than the magisterium of the church does. That doesn't happen in Spain. It doesn't happen in Argentina. I mean, the Pope, when he was in Argentina, he had to contend with a junta, right? <laughs> the, 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 so to me, you're gonna, if, if we're talking about acts of Catholic imagination, we're talking about acts a sacramental imagination. So who are those um, artists and poets and writers and musicians and public figures who are calling us to a different uh, reality, who are pointing to a different reality than the one that we currently in, in, inhabit? and not necessarily from just a purely uh, critical point of view. And, you know, that, that, is a, um, that is the work of the post-Catholic post ghetto, right? And so much of our, uh, uh, un, you know, confusion around this is, is because uh, when we were all relegated to a literal or, or intellectual ghetto, Catholics, then um, it was easy to point to things and say that's Catholic and that's Catholic and then over there that's not, right? Mm -hmm. It's harder today, but that should be a good thing. It's an invitation to reimagine it, exact, really who we are, right? Uh, but on our own terms, not on terms that belong to a culture that is not actually Catholic. Yeah, well, Matt, that, again, that's fine, but when I look at the Catholic higher education, um, the kids are going to Notre Dame and, and uh, Marquette and Loyola is for the same reasons they're going to state universities. They want to get themselves a job. Um, there's not a lot, uh, and the humanities are going down the drain, and I think what we're talking about is a large part uh, conveyed through the humanities. Um, it's going to be a tough haul for these people, uh, for these young people, um, because the whole reason for going where they are, uh, that has changed. You, the the uh, utilitarian, and necessarily so, given the extremely uh, absurd cost of higher education, um, you're, you're not going to reproduce that, um, and they're, they're not going to learn that they're called to be different. They're not called to fit in. They're not called in just to get jobs. And that actually, um, can, as you are saying in an evangelistic tone, we're called to be different. We're called to be disciples of Christ. The implications of that uh, for these kids, they're not aware of yet, that it really, really is um, not just a different labeling system, but a very you know, powerful, um, uh, uh, you need strength in, uh, for the commitment and, f and, and for the long haul. Um, and maybe in, in the Catholicism that I grew up in, which was the, there were boundaries between the world, that was a very good thing because it was a filtration system. It allowed certain things to come in and it kept other things out. It really was an ideal situation because you, you have to be different from other people, sociologically speaking, or feel that you are. Better or worse, I don't care. Um, before you can um, uh, have, have any sense of cohesion. I think it's basic sociology. Um, and I don't think Catholics have that. I think the boundaries are all gone, and there's a, a considerable diffusion of self as well as, uh, as well as community, and I think that's what we're called to, to try to get over. When religion is covered in mainstream media, it's almost always all about the politics of religion or the scandals of religious groups, and there's almost nothing in it about God per se. Um, so, and yet, I found super interesting what you said, Vincent, about you know your colleague telling you that everything is about God for you, because that comes through in your work probably no matter what you're writing about. Um, when I used to write a column for the Washington Post, people would often say, oh, I really enjoy your religious, your religion column, which was interesting because I didn't write a religion column. <laughs> 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 but, but that's how readers saw it. 
So I wanted to ask all of you how you think, um, you have said that, but how you think your faith does, does come through in your work? We had a uh, evangelical uh, uh, Dutch reform editor of Time Magazine, the original editor of Time Magazine, and uh, and I was doing the religion section at Newsweek, and the historian Martin Marty once said, sort of tongue in cheek, um, "Well, I read Time to find out what Protestants think, and I read uh, Newsweek to find out what Catholics think." <laughs> and I thought he was having fun with us in some way. He was actually talking about Henry Luce. Uh, who was the son of a Presbyterian minister, and he had sort of ascribed to all of Time magazine that, even though the major religion writers in my day, uh, or earlier, uh, was, was another guy from Notre Dame, as a matter of fact, I'm very good. He wrote the Is God Dead cover. Um, the, um, um, people would turn to that. They wanted to hear some, uh, to the religion sections, uh, because they wanted to hear some, they, they wanted to see something out there that validated their own experience. I was amazed. We, we were, I came in at Vatican II, and all the editors who were not religious, the, all they wanted to know was what's going on with the Catholic Church. So I used to say, what do you, what's your priorities? Well, the first priority is Catholic. Talk about Catholics. What's the second? Talk about Catholics. What's the third? Talk about Catholics. Fourth, well, maybe the mainline Protestants. And fifth, maybe the Jews, because there aren't that many of them, and, and, and so on. So they wanted to hear about it. In the second half of the 20th century, however, the media was saturated with, with religion and religion stories of all kinds of exciting kinds. I don't care whether it's the Berrigans or putting Paul Tillich on the cover or John Courtney Murray or um, we did a, our annual Jesus covers. I did, I did the life cycle of Jesus backward and forward before I left that place <laughs> um, because there were already new books about who is the real Jesus. It was out there. There were movements. When the bishops wrote a letter on the economy, people paid attention. Since the turn of the century, it's all gone. Although, as, as uh, Melinda said, the issues are every bit as pressing as before. We're still at war. Look what happened. The worst uh, uh, economic turned down since the Depression. 9-11 happened. There are no voices. There are no religious movements that I can see, even though the times are every bit as perilous, um, and the cultural question is why. I want to give you guys in the audience a chance to ask some questions. I'm sure you have some. Um, thank you. Uh, just in response to, to what you just said, and then also to what Vincent was saying about sort of the red pills, I've been. <laughs> kind of wondering if we're uh, due for an age of people finding their way back to the church out of a sense of disillusionment. I think about um, the 30s uh, and you know, Martin and Dorothy Day and people who kind of looked around at the mess that had been made and went, I don't know, maybe I'll be Catholic now. Um, because that, that felt like the only way to make sense of a nonsensical time. Um, and, you know, I have, I have wondered, our, our current moment feels insane. Uh, <laughs> and if people, I guess my question is, it feels like an opportunity for people who are looking for some other way of understanding the world around them, that, um, you know, the, the ways that they have been told and the things that they have been taught to have faith in uh, are perhaps flimsier and, uh, less sturdy than they uh, had reason to believe. Um, but I guess my question is, I sense the opportunity, but is there anything that the church can do to meet it? Um, what, what, is, what does the church do? What can the church do? What do you suggest the church do? Um, you know, there's a, a sea of young people who are looking around at, you know, the climate and the stock market and the water, and sort of going like, I'll just say quickly, you are the church. Get your people together and do it. You don't need the bishops to, to do it. You need to do it. I need to do it. And the second thing is thank you very much for um, articulating that hope. That really is the hope. Fragmentation leading to something. And yes, that's what Merton came out of in the 30s or 40s. Th thank you very much.
Um, hi, uh, I'm 22. I consume a lot of digital media. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, and I see in my daily basis, I'm on Catholic digital pages, and just a few days ago, I was on a, I was on Reddit, I'm on Reddit, right? And I was on a Catholic space on Reddit, and people were posting like a picture of like a 19th century pope with like a quote that's like, we hear a lot about human rights, but what about God's rights? You see, like, yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Uh, and then you see, um, on the same page, there'll be like, today we commemorate the saint who defended Europe against Muslims and stuff like this. And on the con on another hand, you see, like, in New York Times last November, there was a story about uh, more uh, Catholic news outlets publishing names of LGBT church employees. And then those employees having their cars slashed, their offices burned, and stuff like that. So I guess my question is: I see Catholic media, online media that's using the Catholic label, causing rhetorical violence or real violence against people. So I guess what can we do by with, against what can we do with media that is using the Catholic label? that is causing real harm daily to people. Well, first I would, I would say, and I don't mean this in a flippant way, um, don't read it, right? <laughs> uh, because it is, it's toxic and it is, it is doing damage to people. And in a sense, it's, the ways in which we're experiencing the world are different than they were, but there's nothing fundamentally new about what we confront. You know, if people are going to school and they're, they have materialistic ends uh, and that's how they view their education, it's, you know, that's, it's, that's just, that's idolatry. We've contended with that since the beginning of time. Um, and the church has resources to deal with that. I, for one, uh, more often than not, I mean, I see a lot of all of that too. Uh, sometimes um, that violence is directed against me or America or people that I know, people who work in America. Um, more often than not, I'm simply enervated by this, by being held hostage um, by these two factions. One who says the world is ending and the other who says, no, it's just starting. It's just starting, just getting started today, as a matter of fact, right? Um, it seems like the vast majority of us are held hostage by these two people, right? These two factions. And both of them only have a part of the truth. A properly Catholic imagination, I think, is one which sees the world as um, always ending and always just getting started, right? And uh, that because that is what that's what a sacrament points us to it points us to that reality so i would say first of all don't read it that the the uh the problem with a proposition or an argument always lies with its premise right so uh at you asked earlier what we can what we've been doing at our magazine to have try to have our faith inform our work um, we we started making decisions that not rejecting the outcome of arguments, but rejecting their premises. So as a practical matter, we stopped using the words conservative and liberal to describe uh, Catholics in an ecclesial context. We just stopped doing it. We said that those words don't, they're not biblical. They're not from scripture. They are not used in the teaching of the magisterium. They are not a part of our tradition. They belong to politics. We're gonna find other words to do it. But you know, the, 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 the the number of people who thought that that would be impossible to do was huge. Uh, and I know because so many of them told me, they said, that's gonna be really hard. I was like, no, it, we're writers. We'll find other words, <laughs> right? But words that really belong to our tradition, right? Um, you know, naming it for what it is, right? Uh, the, you know, not, not just, use, you know, using the, the language of our tradition to describe reality. You know, it's not just a, it's not just a kind of social science, uh, you know, uh, data-driven notion of materialism. It's idolatry, right? That's what it is. I like, I like inclusive language. Idolatrous is a great inclusive word. 
<laughs> because we all because we all have idols. We all have idols. And the moment we think that it's somebody else, right? That's the problem. Then we've taken one step towards uh, creating one. I think what you said about just don't read it is more important than a lot of people realize. Have that the news consumer has more power than he or she knows because you will get on media what you consume. So people I, I often see complaining about the low level of, of what's available, and it's because of the popularity of the low level of what's, what's available. I, on, again, just last thing on Twitter, uh, the other day I was watching some smart Catholics sort of tear each other apart on Twitter and talking about I'm blocking you and I'm blocking you. <laughs> and I said, oh, who would Jesus block? Two seconds later, somebody messages me back, Jim Martin, of course. <laughs> How much do I owe you, but thank you. Foley Prize winner in America's Poetry Contest back in 1970. <laughs> in America when I was a Jesuit scholastic in 1965. And you got it wrong. Amazing grace has to be sung in the Catholic Church for all the reasons you brought up. I want to hear someone sing it to say, I was lost and now I'm found. I was blind and now I can see. Because my grandmother, my mother, and my father and I have been waiting for the white Catholic Church to sing that song. In fact, in 1972, when I was ordained at East St. Louis by the only black Catholic bishop we had, because I thought the people needed to see another imaginate a church. My Baptist grandmother had to sit there in a ritual that I made her feel comfortable with because I had the people that eventually became the St. Louis Jesuits sing Amazing Grace as a responsorial. It made her feel comfortable. Now, the other remonstrance from a historical point of view is Pentecostalism. It comes from the rain shout that came from Africa. The spirit possession of everyone in the community was an expected outcome of prayer and song and dance. The Pentecostalism that you all mentioned that is just barely 100 years old is actually quite older than that because the AME church split into Pentecostals and AMEs when Bishop Daniel Alexander Payne said he no wanted no longer wanted fist and heel and cornfield ditties being sung at his church, and he wanted them gentrified. I'm only saying that because quite often the voices of the people who created in blood and death liberation theology on this continent, enslaved by African, by Jesuits, visitations, and all sorts of other people. As a brilliant commentary yesterday morning talked about the Catholics who were the instigators of the Stono Rebellion in Carol, South Carolina in 1739. And all of the Union soldiers who came out of Florida and other places who were Catholic and sang Catholic spirituals in order to prepare themselves to go and get killed in the Union in the Civil War. I'm saying this because I heard so much that I agree with and love to hear from you three people. But my history got kicked to the curb over Amazing Grace since that was a song that John Newton heard sung by slaves and he put his conversion text to it. It's got to be in the Catholic Church. Well. Let, 
let me respond that, that my Baptist father would have felt more comfortable when he accompanied my mother to Catholic Mass if he heard it. Now, we know that Amazing Grace, starting with Newton, got changed. The music was uh, changed and the words, uh, 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 verses were added. Uh, those were changed. It's been a malleable product. But as the, product, as the hymn stands now, all I'm saying is if we could change it to not I, but we, we were lost and we were found, that's a communal liturgical expression which doesn't preclude in other settings singing I. That was my only, uh, that's my, uh, my only point on that. But um, um, the relations, I don't want to go into a long detail, but the, 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 the uh, I have an interview with David Tracy coming out in common with and we talk about it there. It's, it's, it's that the relationship between grace and salvation in the Protestant imagination and in the Catholic imagination are different uh, because, because we're not totally lost. Uh, it's the late Augustine's totally lost, but not the earlier one. Um, no, we, grace perfects nature, it doesn't take its place. And that's a real theological difference between the Catholic and Protestant tradition. Uh, we're over time already, but do we have, I, I think we had one last question over here. Sure, thank you. well, thank you for reading, first of all, and uh, I appreciate your question. Um, I think we do believe in having a diversity of voices in our pages, and, um, and I'm proud of the fact that we have had uh, more, uh, we currently employ more women, and we have more women on the staff of America and in the pages of America than probably in the 100 years before uh, the last decade. Um, we, in fact, last year, we we were the first uh, we were the first issue of a Jesuit journal to have uh, it entirely edited and written by women, and we were the first Jesuit journal to have the most comprehensive survey of American Catholic women ever conducted. We do believe in hosting a diversity of voices, but we also have values, and we have an identity as a Catholic organization. Um, and America's editorial line is, um, it, it aligns with the magisterium of the church on the, on, on the issue of abortion and reproductive health. But that doesn't mean that we can't talk about it. And we, there, if somebody told you we don't publish uh, articles that aren't pro-life, I would, that is, they should not have put it that way. Um, I think that, first of all, there is, there is no category of articles except for the most extreme, um, and I think we would probably all agree on what those are, that we would not publish in America. It's a question of how you do it and how you uh, put that piece in dialogue with the other pieces, but also in a way that accurately reflects our, the point of view that we have as a journal of opinion. We actually have an opinion of our own as well. Um, 
but there are ways in which you can do it. And um, we, on another range of issues, we just did it. Uh, you know, we have 111 years of editorials and content opposing communism, but I published a communist, uh, making an argument for why that was compatible with Catholicism. There are ways in which to do it. Um, it's an editorial judgment about how you do it and when you do it, but there is no absolute prohibition on an entire genre of uh, writing. Thanks to everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you.